Hello econ classes. This first video lesson will be on the 10 principles of economics. The main objective of this lesson is to get you to start thinking like an economist. Once you start thinking like an economist, your entire world will change. You will probably want to buy this hat because you will enjoy economics that much. Even babies like economics. Out of all the toys in this room, my daughter just cannot get enough of Daddy's economics textbook. Well, what exactly is economics? Economics is the study of how society manages its scarce resources. We as individuals and nations have unlimited wants, necessities, and desires. However, the ways and means in which we get the things that we want may be limited. These are called limited resources. So the definition of scarcity is the relationship between unlimited wants and limited resources. How to deal with scarcity directly relates to the choices we make. For example, what to produce, how to produce, and for whom to produce. Resources that we may take for granted in America may be limited around the world. Water is a necessity for survival, and if there is a low supply of water in various parts of the world, it is considered scarce. These people waiting in line to get gasoline in New Jersey after the devastating impact of Hurricane Sandy got a first-hand lesson on scarcity. Gasoline was needed to power generators, fuel cars, and heat homes. Can you imagine what our lives would be like if we had to wait in lines for gas like this on a regular basis? Once again, the problem with scarcity is the combination of limited resources and unlimited wants. Every concept in this course relates to scarcity. The 10 principles of economics are grouped into three categories. The first category deals with how people make decisions. Principle number one, people face trade-offs. Should I eat this apple or eat this donut? This is a decision that you will have to make. Trade-offs deal with the decisions we make about anything. Should I go to sleep or study for this exam? Should I work or play a sport at school? Should I go out with my friends or hang out with my family? These are all trade-offs because there are only 24 hours in one day, meaning that time is a scarce resource. Every decision you make involves a trade-off. How you spend your time, energy, and of course money all involve trade-offs. Principle two, the cost of something is what you give up to get it. In economics, we call this opportunity cost. The opportunity to do anything will cost you something. However, the term cost in economics means much more than money. Cost can mean time, energy, effort, and or loss of an opportunity. For example, if this person chooses Dr. A, it costs them Dr. B because they lost out on the opportunity to see that doctor. Remember once again the concept of scarcity. Scarcity and opportunity cost. I have a scarcity of money. I only have twenty dollars. What will I buy? The thing I don't buy is an opportunity I won't have. There's no such thing as a free lunch is an economics concept you will hear throughout this course. You may say, Mr. Thomas, if I eat for free, isn't that considered a free lunch? Not exactly, and here is why. First, someone put forth effort, energy, time, and possibly money to prepare your food. Second, deciding to eat that food was still a choice you made, meaning you could have been doing something else with your time and lost out on potentially other opportunities. Opportunity cost, 
once again, time is a scarce resource. Principle three, rational people think at the margin. Being a rational thinker means having the ability to weigh your pros and cons. In economics, we refer to this as the marginal benefits versus the marginal costs. Are the marginal benefits greater than the marginal costs, or are the marginal costs greater than the marginal benefits? The decision to rent or buy is an example of being rational and thinking at the margin. This can be a tough decision, and people must look at the trade-offs and make a rational decision. Principle 4. People respond to incentives. What motivates you is an incentive. If your incentive is to keep your job, then you will continue to work hard and not get fired. Your incentive may be to get good grades and get into a good college. People are obviously motivated to make money. So keep in mind, people face trade-offs, the cost of something you give up, people weigh their benefits versus costs before making decisions, and the ultimate motivation for making any decision comes down to what are your incentives. The second category of the principles of economics deals with how people interact. Principle 5. Trade can make everyone better off. Because we have unlimited wants and limited resources to get the things we want, trading is one way we address the problem of scarcity. Countries trade with each other all the time because they don't have all the resources to address the problem of scarcity within their geographic borders. The key to trading is that two parties must be willing to trade with each other. Both parties will think rationally at the margin and strike a deal with the right incentives. Principle 6. Markets are usually a good way to organize economic activity. Adam Smith is a name that you will see throughout the course. His principles deal with capitalism entrepreneurship, individual ambition, and allowing the market to grow free from government regulations. The age of industry really embodies Adam Smith's principles. All the new innovative technologies that progress societies forward and all the wealth accumulated during this time period show the growth of the free market and capitalism growing unchecked by the government. Capitalists would not completely support the socialist viewpoints of government intervention or regulation in the economy. For example, if governments raise taxes, that may impact how much a business produces and how many people that business may employ. So by freeing the market from government regulations and high taxes, it could allow businesses to employ more people. Principle 7. Governments can sometimes improve market outcomes. Principle 7 is the complete opposite viewpoint than Principle 6. History has shown that if capitalism grows unchecked as it did during the Industrial Revolution, there could be very low pay for a great deal of work, no workers' compensation, and harsh treatment towards women and children in the workplace. So unions would be an example of how governments can improve market outcomes. Governments can also expand the money supply through expansionary monetary policy and increase government spending through expansionary fiscal policy. Both these measures aim to stimulate the economy and lift the economy out of a recession or even depression. FDR's New Deal and Barack Obama's $831 billion economic stimulus package, his first 100 days of office in 2009, 
exemplify the principle of government involvement to improve market outcomes. Although this sounds good, keep in mind, every time a country spends money that it doesn't have, it adds to the national debt. We will talk more about this in macroeconomics. The third category of the principles of economics deals with how the economy as a whole works. Principle 8. A country's standard of living depends on its ability to produce goods and services. We call this GDP, or gross domestic product in economics. The more a country produces within their geographic borders in a given year compared to other countries, it will have a higher standard of living, meaning the people in that country will have a higher quality of life. Countries with, countries with low GDP will definitely experience scarcity. They will have unlimited wants, such as food in this example, but limited resources or ways of getting the things that they want. Countries with a low GDP will have a lower standard of living and will most likely have a high poverty rate. Rich nations are sometimes criticized for exploiting poorer nations when it comes to their resources. Think about it. The more resources a country has, scarcity will not be as much as an issue for the richer countries, meaning they will have a higher GDP. Principle 9. Prices rise when the government prints too much money. This isn't the first time you have heard of the word inflation. Basically, when the government prints money, the prices of goods will also increase. This can present a problem if prices grow so fast that people cannot buy the same goods that they did before the rise of inflation. If wages do not grow when inflation sets in, it can create a problem for consumers. This can really hurt those that are on fixed incomes, like senior citizens that collect a social security check. Their cost of living, meaning the prices of things that they buy, will increase and overall decrease their standard of living unless they get an increase of money in their social security payments. Principle 10. Society faces a short-run trade-off between inflation and unemployment. Let's visit Principle 7 again. Governments can sometimes improve market outcomes. The government faces a trade-off, meaning a tough decision on whether or not to be active in helping out the economy or be laissez-faire and stay out of the private sector. If the government decides to expand the money supply to stimulate the economy, it will obviously lead to inflation. But money can be used to subsidize businesses. Those businesses could use that money to employ more people. So even though inflation will be high, the unemployment rate will be low. The key to this principle is the word short run. The government can't just keep printing money every time it wants to stimulate the economy. That would destroy the value of the currency. When inflation is high, the government will most likely choose to deflate the currency. That means businesses that were receiving subsidies from the government will lose out on that money. So the trade-off is lower inflation, but higher unemployment. 